You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. You, you feel this this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show, the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to participate, uh, whatever. Screw it. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> the phone number is 608-501-0718. If you're a new caller, you can go to the front of the line. We don't got any new callers, so let's get started with Pedro. Hey, Ryan. It's me, Pedro, the redhead from Brazil again. What's up? I just keep remembering things, so I just keep calling. All good. So this week I'll probably call you like 10 times or something, <laughs> so get ready for it. All good. So I, I made a call before the game. I'm not sure uh, you put it on the show, but I was talking about how good are good against draft picks. You know, this offense that everybody's listening about that, it is, in my opinion, today the best offense in the league. It's 99% players we drafted. We we almost don't have uh, players we trade for on the offense. At least not not the the most important ones, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of them were drafted at great big D three. So you want to talk about process? Yeah. About a culture, about draft and develop, that's it. You know? Our offense is 99% drafted by the Packers, and most of them on late rounds, and it's the best offense in the league. And you know what? Most of these players are still on, uh, on the rookie contract, and they are going to keep growing, and they're not going to be that expensive for the next years. So we have at least one or two years with a top offense to try to win a Super Bowl. And a top offense that it's not expensive. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's about it. And when you look at the defense side, yeah, of course you have higher draft picks, but we still don't have that much of players that we trade for. Most of them are still players who drafted. 99% of the, our team, it's, it's, it's actually with a pack because it's, it's, it's insane. So, yeah, that's it. The process works. Trust the process, the process. Trust our, our GM, that is, in my opinion, the best GM in the league. And that, that's beyond uh, discussion, in my opinion. So, yeah, that's about it. Our, our future is bright. And the reason for that is because we do things right and we keep doing it and we don't get desperate and don't trade the farm to draft Justin Fields and whatever garbage players like the Bears. So yeah, really excited to see how the team is going to grow and how are we going to get even better after this draft class because we are going to get better because that's what the Packers do. We draft players and they improve our team and we keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and we will. We did it for like 30, 40 years and we're going to do it for Another 100. You can wait. So, yeah, that's it. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Perfect timing at three minutes. Yeah, the the other thing, similarly to what you're talking about in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the process and the fact that, you know, a lot of these guys, most of these guys are homegrown and as good as the team is, that they don't have to go out and find other people's scraps to try to patch together the holes that were created by bad management. The other thing I was thinking about, I was looking at PFF did a mock draft. It was like a five round mock draft or whatever. And the, the first pick was Fuaga, the tackle. And my immediate thought was some people would push back. Now nah, we got our tackles. Now I think they absolutely could go tackle in the first round without batting an eye because the gap between, you know, Rashid Walker and David Bakhtiari, if you genuinely think you're getting a David Bakhtiari is pretty staggeringly massive. But regardless of, of that reality, that's going to be the case for almost every position, right? It's like, well, what about corner? Well, I don't know. A lot of people are talking about Valentine and what he's been able to do just as a rookie. 
We also have question marks about Stokes in terms of whether or not he can still be the guy. We've still only ever seen one full season of him, and it was not a bad season. Even Ballantyne looks relatively promising based on how young he is. Um, and so that kind of falls into the same category. You could talk about defensive tackle, but I don't know why it's coming along as a pass rusher. Brooks and Wooden are looking pretty stout, especially as late round developmental rookies. So I, I think really for most positions, it's going to be a situation where there isn't a dire need, with the exception maybe of interior offensive line, maybe safety, although that hasn't really seemed to be a massive issue. It really just comes down to what the draft actually is all about. Get the best possible players you can and improve the team as, as well as you can. I mean, that's, it's not about patching holes. It's about trying to find studs. And so if we don't find studs, we're fine. Otherwise, we're just looking for upgrades. If we draft a tackle, we're trying to get another David Bakhtiari. If we're getting a corner, we're trying to find another Jair. If we get a pass rusher, we're trying to get another Rashawn. If we get a defensive tackle, we're trying to, you know, I don't know what we're trying to, probably trying to find a run defender or something. I don't have an example for that. (laughs) But we're just trying to go from we're okay to we're actually really freaking good at this now. It's a good spot to be in. Hey, back, Daddy. It's Nate. Yep. Um, I was just uh, sitting here early this morning, um, having my having my energy drink, and I I, I had a sad a sad but happy realization. Um, it's sad because we hit on so many picks in the last two years that it, in like four you know in like four years, four or five years, um, you know, give or take when when these guys' contracts start ending. We are either going to have to pay them a just ton of money, just a ton of money, because all these guys are playing so well, or we're going to have to get rid of them. And it makes me really sad because either we're going to have to like chew up cap space or we're going to have to say goodbye to some of the best players that we've ever seen. Like, I'm just going through my through my brain, and I'm like, on offense, like, what, we hit on two tight ends and four? Four, four or five receivers that are that are like legit guys. Like at least, I would say we have at least four number two guys. Like four guys who could go be at least a number two. Some of them could probably be a number one on on a lot of teams. Like that's just crazy. That's stupid crazy. And then on top of that, we hit on the most important piece, quarterback. And Jordan Love. Like I know we just like added an extra extension onto him, but now like after this season, like how much we how much good lord, if he if we make this run, if we beat the Niners go and yeah. he wins a Super Bowl in his first year. Oh, he's gonna get stupid bro. just like uh what do we give him like uh the Patrick Mahomes contract, like half a billion dollars, something like that. Yeah. Like uh, it just Well it'll probably end up being more. It'll be the Pat Mahomes contract adjusted for current day. It's a good thing, but Man, man, these guys are going to be commanding so much money with the way that they're playing. Especially if they can, if this is like not just like a one year thing. If all these guys actually like come back next year and they're playing the same way, like this team is stupid good, man, and stupid young. We're going to have years of this. Oh, it makes me happy. And I'm generally more of a realistic. Um, some would say negative, but. There's there's no negativity from me today, none none whatsoever. You know, I I want to talk bad about the defense, but I mean, if our if our offense can can throw up a forty forty burger on a, on a playoff team, like you know, I think they can outplay this defense if this defense can just tighten up just a little bit more. Maybe don't allow thirty points. Maybe maybe try to keep it under under twenty like it was originally, and and the Super Bowl's ours. You know, there's there's. Like we can just we can go do that. The hardest thing is going to be these Niners coming up. I it, I got that feeling in the pit of my stomach that it's just it's going to be a buzzsaw, and we're it's going to be a dogfight. Like we're yeah. So I I just want to touch on that a little. First of all, as far as the pay thing, I think that's something we tend to worry about a lot. That always tends to sort itself out in the end. We 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 look at the way the situation is and we just say we can't pay it. And I don't think it ever really pans out that way. So the Packers are going to be patient. They're going to allow these things to work themselves out. Some guys might face injury issues. Some of them may start to decline in their play. And you'll be left with situations where somebody has earned it all the way up until it's, it's time to pay up. 
and the Packers will have to make a decision. And then if you're sitting there with three guys looking to get paid at the exact same time and all of them have played very well, then then they'll have to figure that out in terms of how they structure it, possibly reeling back in at other positions, not investing in running back and tight end quite as much. But even that, it's also important to remember we're as much as as we're all excited about the play, we don't I don't think we have a top 10 receiver on the team. Maybe Christian Watson, if he can stay healthy, maybe he can be that guy. I, th- I as you know, think that he has that kind of upside, but you know, we got to see it. I got to see a full season of him being able to do that. Um, and even then, you know, the injury history may impact how much um, he actually commands. On top of that, we, we have, at, at least as of right now, we have two low end number ones. Dontavian Wicks ranks 28th and Jaden Reed ranks 31st. So what would that kind of command? Is that slightly above? I don't, I don't know what MVS was viewed as, but I remember being surprised how much money he got at the time. A couple of years ago, he got, what, the, the $10 million a year contract? So again, adjust that for whatever it is, but maybe that's what you're looking at is, is two guys sitting there looking for about $10 million, maybe one guy asking for more. But I don't think it's like the $30 million wide receiver guy. Maybe it's a, a 12, a 15, and a, and a 21. Is that, is that feasible? Well, number one, are they going to get it all? Like, if you have a superstar, sometimes they get paid early. Some of the other guys, it may be kind of delayed. And then there's the structure of it. You know, are we going to front load this one and maybe kind of back load the other one? And, you know, they don't usually do that, but just as a way to kind of spread it out so that it's it's feasible. And then they're going to structure every single contract so that, you know, the only time they're stuck is going to be in the first year or two, depending on how big the contract is. After that, they have a lot of flexibility. And if, if the cap becomes... Uh, complicated, we can move money around, but you're also just kind of waiting again for things to sort themselves out, waiting for somebody to get paid and then fall off, waiting for somebody to get injured so that you can move off of them. So a lot of things are going to change between now and then, some positive, some negative, but every time for my entire life, it's always been, I remember when like Favre got paid, it was like, oh no, we're ruined. It's over. It's done. And it it didn't hurt anything. I mean, we, we went out and paid a bunch of guys. And then Favre got paid again, and it's, you know, the, the number always seems astronomical. And look at the Chiefs. I mean, same with the Chiefs. They, they got that Pat Mahomes contract, the actual Pat Mahomes contract. It's like, well, they're, they're screwed for the rest of all civilization. And they went on to win more Super Bowls. Now, they moved on from Tyreek, but I don't think that was necessarily a necessity. I think they just saw what Tyreek wanted and realized that that's not what they want to pay. And I, I do wonder, knowing what they know now, if they would have just bit the bullet and gone and done it. But again, we don't have Tyreek on the team anyways. So that's my thought. Um, we're, we're several ways away, and we'll allow these things to uh, sort themselves out. And I think it will. The only thing I will add is, I'm, I'm not going to say it's impossible, because I, I do remember thinking this, and maybe I was just wrong thinking it in the past, but it did kind of feel like, at least for a while, you know, if you won the Super Bowl, you might be in trouble. And especially if you were like the Legion of Boom Seahawks, because it was like one or two really good draft classes. And then they won the Super Bowl. And then they all wanted to get massively paid all at the same time. And that's when you started to see guys slowly go bye-bye. Like you go bye-bye this year. Next year, that guy goes bye-bye. You know, it's just, they slowly started to get rid of guys who went on to have good careers in other places. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I also don't think we have, you know, as many truly elite guys. I think we're playing like an elite team or an elite offense, but I, I think it's a really good combination of just having that quarterback that elevates everybody around him, a very good play caller that's getting guys open, and then the rest of these guys kind of filling in the blanks. Plus, when one guy falls off, even for several weeks, like Dobbs, you don't even notice it because somebody else picks up the slack. So quantity is kind of filling in and making it seem as though everybody's maybe slightly better than they are. And I don't mean that to be disparaging. I just I'm, I'm just tamping it down a little bit in terms of like how genuinely elite each individual piece actually is. Ryan, I hate that cut off so goddamn much. <laughs> Sorry. It, there's no way you can extend that. Ugh. I don't think so. Never mind. Um, anyway, I, the, the Niners game scares me just because obviously it's, it's the Niners. They've, they've had our number for a while. Well, we'll just say a while. Like you, They just tend to out, out coach, out play just out everything us. And then they've also just been looking fantastic this year. Um, so like they, they were any, we can beat them. I definitely think that we can beat them, especially this offense um, with how they're playing. Again, the worry is always going to come back to the defense. Like is the defense going to have one of those days where it shows up and plays elite and holds them to, you know, 
less than two touchdowns? Or is this going to be, you know, going to allow 35 points to them and it's going to be an offensive shootout and we're going to have to hope, hope that we can have another performance like we just did. So um, I'm maintaining optimism for once um, because I've got, like this season has changed so much. I was uh, just a few, you know, not that long ago. Like after our losing stretch, a lot of us were like looking at the draft. We're like, uh, you know, we could be getting a really high pick here. And now we're talking about a possible Super Bowl. Like the resilience of this team is just insane. And that's what I've wanted for so long because it felt like when we had Rodgers, this team had no resilience. One one little piece, one little piece breaking down, or just yeah, you know, it was over. Yeah. Anything going wrong, and it would just be collapse, all out collapse. But now, no, no, you, you know we don't. Uh, you know we don't score on a drive. Jordan Love doesn't panic. He's like, yeah, we're gonna score on the next one. So, so I love to see it go back. Go. It is funny because you know we just kind of call that momentum, and it's not even just like a Packers phenomenon. We all recognize it, especially maybe especially as Packer fans. But I think we just got so used to it. You know you. You go three and out on a drive, and you're like, well, we're screwed. We're screwed. Momentum's 100% in their favor. Momentum just doesn't feel like it's been as much of a thing as a Packer fan this year. It hasn't been as much of a thing where you can just feel the game reaching out of your grasp. I mean, even that Dallas game, like you felt momentum switch, and it's like, oh, don't even do this to me. And then we just won, and it was like, oh, okay, never mind. I just feel like that's happened a lot this year. It's like, oh, here we freaking go. And it's like, oh, we, we, okay, it didn't go. I thought, it, I thought, I thought that was a thing where we were in trouble, and then it wasn't. Even the, what was it, Chicago? I think it was, I can't remember, but where, I mean, we were dominating Chicago, but the score was really close. And my whole fear was, you know, you come out at halftime, you just don't know what's going to happen. They could come out flat, the Bears could come out hot, you know, you never know. And it was just a continuation of the first half. Like, no, it's the same thing. We're not changing, we're just going to do it again. Like, oh, that's weird. I, I just I just assumed, you know, we, we have all these things, again, even across the NFL, like, You'll hear the announcers say it, you hear fans say it, like you can't you can't keep it this close. You can't allow somebody to stay this close or it'll come back to bite you. And the Packers, it's like they just don't know these rules. Like, nah, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. Like, we're just gonna do it again. Like, okay. Dope. As far as the uh the 49ers having our number, I, I brought this up um I mean two years ago, last time last time it came up. And um It ended up working against us because we did lose the last time we saw the 49ers. But do you know our record against the 49ers the last three meetings? The Packers are 2-1. and When we face them uh, in the 2020 season, we face them, and this is, you know, we're talking regular season, but still, we face the the, uh, 49ers in 2020. We beat them 34-17, beat the living crap out of them. And so, again, the the whole thing with, like, well, Shanahan just has our number. They know how to do it, it, it. Beat the crap out of them, thirty-four to seventeen. Then we saw them again in twenty twenty-one, which is a little bit of a down uh, down year compared to twenty twenty, but still, you know, pretty good year. Beat them thirty to twenty-eight. Then there was the twenty twenty-two season, um, and the defense dominated their offense, only allowed um, thirteen points, or, or maybe not even, but whatever. They the, the team only allowed thirteen points but the offense can only score 10, right? It was just a complete offensive implosion. The offensive line completely crapped the bed. David Bakhtiari being out was a massive issue. Putting Billy Turner on the freaking field, period, was always a disaster, but they continued to do that. Um, and then Rodgers just couldn't, he just could not handle, you know, guys, either the guys couldn't get open or he just couldn't handle the pressure or some combination therein, and they just couldn't move the ball. But it's, it's not like every single game is 38-10, 49ers. And in Matt LaFleur's entire career, the, Pack, the 49ers are 3-2 and two against the Packers. I mean, it's, it's like 50-50. So I just don't want to get too carried away. And again, the last time I said that, I was like, it was before that last game. I was like, bro, we're 2-0 and in our last two meetings. I don't know what you're talking about. And then we ended up losing. But yeah, it, it's just, it's not really the case as much as we remember. I think we just misremember because we keep losing in the postseason. We lost to the four. We got knocked out by the 49ers, 37 to 20. And then we got knocked out by the 49ers again, 13 to 10. And that sticks out in our mind. And we just forget about the two regular season games where we beat the 49ers. And, you know, it, well, that's the regular season. I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to equate them. I'm trying to dismiss the nonsense notion 
that Kyle Shanahan has Matt LaFleur figured out and Matt LaFleur just can't beat him. That's what I'm addressing, which clearly is untrue because we've won two out of the last three meetings. And in two of the last three, we've scored over 30 points in those victories. So so there's that. And I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, therefore, we're going to beat the crap out of the 49ers. I'm just saying we overuse the Shanahan has Matt LaFleur figured out thing. Anyways, why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back and hear from Aaron. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Aaron, Zaren, happy Victory Monday. Yeah, on my way to work on this Victory Monday over the Dallas Cowboys. Man, um, so as great of a victory as that was, right, we got even bigger tests coming up this week. And there is no possible way that the Niners players sitting there watching that game last night saw that and didn't go, shuck, we got to work this week. Like, we just showed this whole nation, everyone, what this team can do and what they are capable as the youngest team in playoff history. You know the Niners aren't going to take this light. There's no right. garbage time this week. There's not going to be the moment where you can say, Jordan Love, get out of the game. They're, just, they're not coming back. That's not going to happen. We're playing the Niners. We're playing the San Francisco Niners in the divisional round of the playoffs in San Francisco. Like, I, I know I, I, I've got faith in our team, though. This is why I'm so excited that if last night was one heck of a game, ooh, next Sunday you got – Master versus Apprentice, Dwight Schrute versus Michael Scott in a sales competition to win them all. Um, it, it's Sean Mc, not Sean McVay. Um, it's uh, whatever. Uh, Kyle Shanahan versus uh, Matt Lafleur, and dude, the game planning for this between those two. Oh man, I guess that's going to be fun to watch. Uh, I, I I got full faith in this team. Um, go out there, win or lose. We already proved so much. Um, but a win next week would prove so much more. Um, so let's just go out there, not take the Niners lightly, because they sure as heck won't be taking us lightly anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, happy victory Monday. I'm about to stop for gas. Um, so let's let that be all gas, no brakes. Bring it on, baby. Bring on them Niners. Oh, shoot, I thought I hung up. I'm sorry. Bye. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I clipped out like 14 seconds of that. I, I found it funny, but I figured everybody would get annoyed. Anyways, yeah, the 49ers are, are not going to take this lightly. They're going to come out and give everything that they've got, and they've got a lot. Uh, you know, hopefully there's a little bit of rust there. You know, they sat their starters, and then they had their bye week. I don't know how much truth there is to any of that being real. But hopefully there's some truth to it. We're going to need all the help we can get. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's every reason to be nervous, and, and there's, there's really no reason to expect any favors or any collapses or anything like that. I, I think you just got to give it your all. Expect this one to be a little bit more of a grind. Now, granted, I expected the last one to be two, and we blew them out. But, um, you know, just, just be prepared to be stressed. And uh, we may need some, some Jordan Love heroics in this one. There may need to be a lot, of, a lot more overcoming of, of adversity. 
But uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens when we get there, I suppose. Pedro, what's going on? Hey, Ryan. It's me again. Pedro the Redhead from Brazil. What's up? <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm, I'm going to waste like half of my income on these overseas calls. Oh, but <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. So I was thinking here about the defense and the defensive coordinator. So let's talk about Joe Barry. I, I was watching the the post-game locker room video, and I saw how Joe Barry was hyped and how some players were were, were hyped for him uh, when Matt LaFleur yeah. talked about the defense. So I'm not sure we're not going to keep him next year. Yeah. I wish we don't, but I'm not sure. So there's that. And but in the the possibility that we don't keep him and we go after another coordinator, I'm gonna tell you this: playing the way the Packers are playing, and as young as the Packers are, if I were a defensive coordinator that had like multiple job offers, I would want to go to the Packers. Yes. I would want to work for the Packers because you know. Even though he's a defensive coordinator, the offense is really good. And if you are in a really good offense, you are in a team that's going to probably try to win a Super Bowl for the next few years. And you have a lot of talent on the defense, that that kind of players. And it's a good chance for you two to ramp up your career. So I think that this stretch that we're making in the, the end of the season, even if we don't win the Super Bowl, because if, if we win the Super Bowl, uh, keep Joe Barry, I don't care. That's it. That, 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 that's my, my, my deal. Win the Super Bowl, and you can keep Joe Barry. So, yeah. But even if we don't win, it's a pretty damn good place for you to work. You know, you, you look right. at the, the Packers and say, you know what? They have a bright future. They have a good team. They have talent on the both sides of the ball. They are not in, in cap hell or something. Uh, we will not lose a lot of players in the next few years because most of them are on, on, on their contracts and not real expensive ones. So, yeah, I think that that, 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 that can be a, a really good thing for the Packers moving on. So, yeah, that was your thought. So, talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Yeah, as far as the uh, the players kind of seemingly liking him, I did notice that too. You know, they, I saw Darnell Savage was asked about him, and, and you know, he he kind of sidestepped it a little bit, and more or less just talked about um, you know team dynamics or whatever. But still, it 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 it's not the vision that I think a lot of us were either expecting or hoping, which is. You know, guys roll their eyes and they're like, this freaking guy sucks. I can't stand him. It's hard to know. Bottom line is it's hard to know how much of it is being polite and how much of it is actually we really like Joe Barry. We think he's the the best guy for the job and we want him to be here. But I do think you bring up a real good point about this being a popular destination and, and that also being a really good opportunity for the Packers to be able to go to the front of the line because, you know, it's it, there's always been the narrative that nobody wants to go to Green Bay, which I don't think is necessarily true. Maybe all things being equal, that's not everybody's preference. Um, but it's it's it, I think most people are motivated by other factors. I think money is a major factor, but also fit. And as far as I can tell, Matt Lafleur is very well respected, not by uh, what's his nuts, Michael Lombardi, but you know some of the top coaches around. You know the the uh, the entire Shanahan tree is all really close with him, which is a very high-end group right now but you also got the you know the, the, the sala who's best friends with them whether the old guard likes him or not is kind of irrelevant because the new kids are taking over and they're all very close with matt lafleur he's a very respected guy but beyond that it's a question of well, how do you want your career to go and number one i think most defensive coordinators would prefer a job with an offensive head coach because if you have a defensive head coach you're kind of just the number two defensive guy so you want to be the guy that gets to run the defense because it looks better on your resume. You're not going to get a head coaching job as the DC behind a head coach who's a DC. I mean, you, you might, but it's really unlikely. So that works in his favor. But then you've also got a very young group, a very talented group with a lot of high price pieces on it. And it's basically plug and play. It's like, hey, here's a team that is competing for a Super Bowl, potentially won a Super Bowl. I don't know exactly what the, 
the dynamics are going to be, but it's going to be a very good dynamic. A team that's going to compete for a very long time. A team that is stacked with talent on defense. You've got top-end pass rushers that are established as well as uh, moldable. So you can still grow Rashawn. Lucas Van Ness needs help. Wyatt is an ascending star. Brooks and Wooden are young guys with a ton of upside. You've got a moldable Quay Walker. You've got a high-end Devondre, who's had a bad year, but, you know, obviously he has high-end potential. You have Jair Alexander, who is a top 10, top 15 corner. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say 15 so that we can call it not debatable. And if you want to fight me on that, then you're just being absurd. As well as, you know, a, def- or a GM that seems more than willing to get you your guys whenever you want them, especially if you're the defensive coordinator. Oh, you need one of these? You got it. First round pick all day long. Matt, wait till the fourth round. We'll get you. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get there, bud. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple, I don't want to say simple, but I mean, of all the jobs, what, what, what better job do you want? Aside from guys that are not going to be getting rid of their defensive coordinator, like I, I would assume uh, there was some talk that Andy Reid could potentially be either retiring or whatever, and then maybe Spagnolo, you know, ends up not being the DC. Maybe that's the job you want. But I don't know if that's the job I want, because I think the DC there did such an unbelievable job with lesser talent. And so your ability to go in there and replicate what he's done is very low. On top of that, Andy Reid is gone, and this is a team on the decline. I don't know that there's a more desirable spot to be a defensive coordinator based on how this season has gone and all the other factors involved. And a very stable environment that does not like to fire coaches with very low expectations, right? If you if you produce a top 10 defense, I mean, there are places around here where if you produce a top 10, like the 10th best defense, you went backwards and you suck. In Green Bay, if you come in with the pieces that you have, which can easily produce a top 10 defense and you produce the 10th best defense, we will erect a shrine in your freaking name. I just, I don't think there's a better, I don't think there's a better job. On top of that, the way that this team is going, and that's the other thing. I mean, do you want to take another step? Do you want some head coaching shots? If, if that's the case, at the end of the day, although there, there is an opportunity that you can be on a bad team, but you still get plucked, most of the time, they're looking at successful teams. Coaches are getting hired away from the Chiefs, the 49ers, they're not really getting hired away from the Jets. I mean, they can. It's possible. But if you want to put your name in lights, attach yourself to a, a playoff team. Hey, Zan, sorry. I wanted to call back. Um, but to add on to my last call, against the Niners, right? Mm-hmm. The starters have had essentially two, well, they haven't had essentially, they've had two full weeks off. So that's Yes. Like what? Three weeks worth of practicing and worth worth of uh, like downtime for the starters, for the Niners, um, and I'm sure that that is going to play a role in this game, whether it's Saturday or Sunday. Um, we'll find out later tonight, I guess. Um, but it's like we got the white hot Green Bay Packers going up against the Niners who have sat their starters for um, essentially three weeks for the practice. Sorry, I was just passing a dude sitting in the middle lane going 20 miles an hour under the speed limit. Like, dude, get over to the right lane. Um, But anyways, yeah. It's... Man, this matchup is going to be fuego. Pure fire. Um, as the young kids, but not the super young kids, just the young kids that were young a little bit ago, this game is going to be lit. Yeah, um, for sure. And I am so excited for this game. Um, my, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it this is better than anybody could have ever asked for as Jordan Love's first year. Um, I was riding with him from the beginning. Um, I got a lot of hate for that and being like, hey, how could you want Aaron Rodgers gone? Because we have Jordan freaking love. That's why I want Aaron Rodgers gone. But no, I I, mean, it, it, I, I just saw the problem and Jordan love is, oh man, oh, Jordan love. Um, I think all the haters, other than maybe a few, uh, Jordan love is won over 
And yeah, let's bring on the Niners. Oh yeah. Oh, San Francisco next weekend. Let's go. But I'm referring to Jersey Mike. You get Jersey Mike to San Francisco right now. Right. Um, anyways, peace out. Bye. Really got into that song. That was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it feels good. I mean, everything feels good. Everything feels good. Everything is right with the world. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like we endured so much so we deserve this, but in a small way, at least those of us who have been, you know, supportive of the team and the process, supportive of the GM in particular, supportive of the head coach and the job that he's been doing, supportive of the players surrounding the quarterback and not just the quarterback, supportive of the decision to move on from Aaron Rodgers, not based on hatred, but based on situation, it's been a little bit of a grind. And um, everything right now is just freaking roses. Everything is coming up roses, man. Everybody in the world now sees it the way that we've been seeing it and saying it. And that's just the cherry on top of the fact that, dude, we've got another quarter. And I don't even really like saying it because it's like, I don't know, it's still possible that it's not real. But we're, we're bordering on it being really, 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 really unlikely that it's not real. Bordering on impossible that it's not real. But it feels so impossible that it is real, I don't exactly know what to do with it. So I generally don't like saying it, but dude, it's just, it's just right there and he keeps getting better. And it, it, you know, again, everybody has good games. Everybody has good throws. Everybody has highlight reels. Nobody does what Jordan Love has done. What are we talking about? We 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then the wild card. That's is that eleven games, bro? I I I, I would I would. It's almost worth the effort to go back and look at the history of every single quarterback ever. That's like bad. And be like, did they ever just like dominate for eleven games? Were they ever like the best quarterback in the NFL for three quarters of a season? Or you know, I guess not quite three quarters, but you know, a lot of a lot of games. Over half a season, that ever been a thing? Because I know we've seen some stuff. Guys being good, I know. Like if there was a time when I was like, you know, Derek Carr is is actually a lot better than people give him credit for, and Kirk Cousins. But that was always like top ten, not number one in elite games on st- on you know stacked on top of elite games, stacked on top of elite games. So I don't, know. I don't even remember what we were talking about Aaron. I'm just uh, <sighs> think think things are. Things are good right now. That's all I can say. Yo, Uncle Rico here Monday morning. So listening to some, some Ryan Schlipp doing some broadcasting mm. on the old Backer Net podcast. Mm. Just amused by some people. I mean, I get it. I'm, I'm a, you know, armchair quarterback myself, of course. Sure. Armchair GM. You know, but I just get a kick out of it. Cut. Jair. Trade Jair. Get rid of Jair. You know, early on or last year, or hopefully not now. Get rid of Jordan Love. He sucks. Blah blah blah. You know, and all these people they don't know who who they, we're going to replace these people with. Even if we do get rid of them, then who's? You know, I mean, I know the argument. Uh, jump like the whole uh, defensive coordinator thing. I, I don't have a problem with trying to replace him because he hasn't proven that he is worthy, but. Or has he? Did he just prove it? I don't know. But now it's Anders Carlson. Get rid of him. Get dump him. Yeah. When is when are all all of us back fans gonna realize that Goot is smarter than we are? Goot knows what he's doing. If we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't be doing the jobs we're doing. Go Goot. Go Pack. Go. Yeah. And just to be clear, go out. Oh, hello there. Hi. Goodbye. Um, you know what you're talking about as far as the. Joe Barry thing. I don't like the argument of who are you going to replace him with because it's it's not necessary to know the answer to that question. However, with that said, Joe Barry, Jair Alexander, and who's the other one you mentioned? Andres Carlson. Three very unique situations. So strictly saying who are you going to replace him with, and if you can't answer that, then you can't move on, isn't a good argument in and of itself. But with Joe Barry, the argument is it's been three years and he's produced nothing but bad defenses. That's not what we're looking for, and so it's time to move on. With Jair Alexander, it's the fact that he's been a essentially a top 10 corner, top 15 corner consistently. Leave out the number one thing, because I feel like maybe that's causing more harm than anything else. 
Because if you set the standard at number one, then it's like, oh, well, what about these years? Like, okay, forget that then. Just forget the whole freaking thing. He is a solid starting cornerback. He is a number one corner every year that he's in Green Bay. Call it, call it top 32. I don't care. And so the reason I don't want to move on is, is that reason. And then for Anders Carlson, it's just, it's a patience issue. There hasn't been enough time. And I know for most of us, you look at it and say, I've seen enough. Uh, you know, like I said with, with Jordan Love and a lot of other people, that we've got a big enough sample size where it just feels unlikely at this point that things are going to turn around. And although I acknowledge it can, I don't think it's going to, and I'm willing to risk whatever. But there is still a question of who are you going to replace him with from the standpoint of risk versus reward. So look at Jair. Can, can you find somebody better than Jair? Yes. How likely is it you find someone better than, than Jair? Very low. What is the replacement of the, the amount of talent that you get when you remove Jair? Or you could even say the odds that you go backward. Significantly higher. So it's not a question of, well, you have to give me a name so much as it is just cost benefit. If we make the decision Jair is gone and somebody else comes in, we're very likely going backwards. On, on top of the fact that it's just we could draft somebody, keep him, and have two good corners. Anyways, and with Anders, you could say, well, they're, they're, it's relatively high that we could find somebody that we could find somebody that ends up being better than him or will be better than him or whatever. But I think with that, you just get caught in kind of a loop. Let's just say it's 50-50 that the person that you get ends up being better than Anders Carlson because we don't know what Anders Carlson is going to be. We don't have enough information, and that's the whole point. But that's not even the question. The question is, what are the odds that this rookie kicker or even you know veteran kicker is going to come in and, and be good enough immediately to satisfy what the fans feel we should have? Well, that's low. Okay, well then, what's going to happen then? We have to replace him, and you get just stuck in this loop. So, I don't know. I mean, I, they're all very different, I guess. Do we take a second break? I don't think so. Why don't we take a break? We'll take our second break. We'll come back and hear from Trevor in Virginia. Brian! Yo. Trevor in Virginia. What's up, Mike? It is Monday morning, and I don't even know if you'll get to this call, because I'm sure you have so many. I know last night you said you had, like, 70 already. Um... Man, I just still can't believe what happened in that game. I mean, it's just unreal. The way Jordan Love is playing, and I'm very mad at Tucker Craft. You know, when we brought the starters back out because we took him out a little too early, which I think was a bad look. But um, he, I think he could have caught that ball. He should have caught that ball. So it's like, uh, you know, if he catches that ball, Jordan Love still has his perfect passer rating. Right. And, but if that's all we have to be mad about, then, you know, we're doing, we're doing pretty good. So, um but, no, I mean, just Jordan Love was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. That touchdown pass to Wicks off his back foot, like, yeah. I know we saw it earlier in the season. It's like, the thing was just beautiful. And then, like, it seemed like some of his passes might have been a little off, like, but then you watch the replays and they're not. Like, the, the touchdown to Romeo Dobbs, when he threw it, I was like, man, he made Dobbs work for that. Like, he threw it way behind him, and Dobbs had to, like, you know, jump back, which was a great play by Dobbs. I don't know. There wasn't enough made... The fact that he was going the other way and jumped backwards to that right, ball right, right. I agree. was unbelievable. But I thought he put it way too far behind him. But then you watch the replay, and if it was any less behind, the defender was going to get a hand on it. So it was just perfectly placed ball just far enough away for Dobbs to go make the play and just out of the reach of the defender. Like it, I just can't believe the way it's going. And then, you know, I hope Jair's all right. Um, sounds like Anibari's out for the rest of the um, But, yeah, I don't know. Um, Losing you. Uh, let's just, yeah. All, well, I'm just out the window, and I'm I'm ready for Super Bowl. I mean, I'm in Super Bowl mode right now. So, um, go back up. Yeah, I, I had that thought too, actually, about the Romeo Dobbs thing. Um, I mean, if if he doesn't catch that, it's one of those where we go back and look at that and go, man, it was a beautiful throw. He probably should have caught that, but that's a tough catch. But you're also right about the throw. I mean, when you look at it, it's like, I don't even know how somebody can have the mental capacity to know exactly where to throw the football. Because that defender dove, and it went past it. Like, I wouldn't know. I just wouldn't know. I would have probably thrown it right to where Dobbs was, and it would have been picked. I mean, some of this stuff seems relatively intuitive, just as far as like, yeah, just throw it over there, and then it'll get there, and it'll be fine. That's one of those things where I looked at it and go, nope, nope, I'd have been wrong about that one for sure. <laughs> I've been way off. And he had that calculated 
in a millisecond in his brain and accurately threw it exactly where he calculated it needed to be thrown, and it was down to the millimeter. I just don't know how that's possible. I don't know how he does that. And 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 the fact that it was just such a good game and there's so many good plays and so many good throws and so so many great repercussions of the situation that you almost wish that was the only play of the game so you could really just admire how amazing it was and it's like it just it just ends up blending together with all the others. It's like yeah, but that was actually really freaking crazy. Ryan, it's your wife. Just wondering Hi. if now you are going to start eating vegetables on a regular basis. I'm very no. excited for how this turned out with the live stream and people were paying you to eat veggies and you did great. I'm so proud of you. See you. Bye. It's like when your mom tries to embarrass you in front of your friends. Mom, stop. No, I'm not eating vegetables. Get out of here. I'm talking about the Packers with my friends. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> oh, boy. But no, as she's well aware, the answer is no, I have not been eating vegetables since that happened. I did get uh, my new little Dutch oven guy, so I've been playing with that a lot. Been making pot roast like every day. <laughs> I just, I want to make something different. I mean, it's not really pot. I mean, it's just, I'm making meat in, in the Dutch oven kind of the same way. I only did it once with like the potatoes and carrots and stuff, but. I want to do a bunch of different things to experiment with what you can do with this thing. But at the same time, it's like, I also just want to be really, really good. Just keep doing it. Keep learning how to make just a really good little little pot roasty thing. I tell you what, I've learned it's actually very easy. If you want to just make the meat, sear the meat, then you put in beef broth. Somebody said, was it two cups? Because it's like a half of a fork. Maybe, maybe it's a whole thing. It's too much, though. I don't need that much juice. And then... Um, I use a little bit of apple cider vinegar. Could use, most people would probably tell you to use like a, a wine or whatever. I don't care. I use apple cider vinegar. And then a little bit of uh, Worcestershire sauce. And then the only thing I do different is I treat it like I'm grilling as opposed to, like I put it in the oven, but I treat it like I'm grilling. It's not like two hours at three fit, none of that crap. Time and temp, baby. So what I try to do is get it to about 190 and try to hold it for at least an hour. Two would probably be ideal. So after an hour, check it, temp, you know, probe it. If it's at 190 degrees, now it's at the point where like the collagen and stuff is breaking down. You don't need any more temperature. You don't want to go higher. You don't want it to be 250 degrees. It's going to turn into sand. Don't keep blasting it in the oven at 350 degrees. Try to get it to maintain that temperature for an hour or two to further break everything down. You're good to go, man. It's delicious. If anybody else has any tips to make it better, let me know because I'm I'm just I'm just figuring it out, but I did that yesterday and it was good. I did the uh, beef tips today, and those are just not as good. I mean, it's basically the same thing; it's just all chopped up, but it's just hard to keep it as like you know tender and moist and everything because it's just individual little cubes and they dry out faster. Still good, but eh. it's better to just get the hunk and then shred it after. In my opinion, Nico. Oh, man, oh man. Here we go to the couch. That's what the Cowboys are screaming right now. I tell you what, uh, Nico, it's Monday morning, just warming my car up uh, before I go to work. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm just shocked. I'll say this. It's amazing what one day will do because yesterday at this time, me and probably almost every Packer fan was like, hey, you know what? We're playing with house money. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, we just... We're glad we're here. Just happy to be here. This is going to be a learning experience for these yeah. on team. Now we're like, bring on the freaking 49ers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not the worst script in the world. Um, because they've come to our house and beat us uh, in the playoffs enough. Yeah, enough. And each enough. time I was fairly confident. Well, maybe not the last time. Uh, and I guarantee you, one of my buddies is a Niners fan. He was texting me during the game. He was excited because he wanted us to win because they don't care about us. Right. But after the game, I'm like, hey, you sure you want to play us? Because we just dropped a 50 burger on one of the better defenses. And he's like, oh, I don't add. I'm like, okay. Yep. And I will admit, the Niners have a much scarier team. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> Like I so said, you can't write a script like this. If we go and, and if we go in there and beat them, then I believe we can win the Super Bowl. Yeah. And I know Baltimore is insanely talented. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but I don't care. And if we go in there and we beat the Niners, and then we end up in the Super Bowl, 
And we win it. I guess Joe Barry is our defense coordinator next year. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Do I like it? No. But maybe <laughs> it's uh, a compromise you're willing to make. Maybe just this last month he's figured out how to become a defensive coordinator. So I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, Jordan Love. You know, I feel like <clears throat> you ever, Brian, you ever dreamed you like win win a bunch of money back to the lottery, I wish and you I wake up for dreams. a split second, you think you're a millionaire, like ah, it was a dream, crap. I feel like I'm that now with Jordan Love. Like yeah. he can't be this good. This is he is the best first year starter I've ever seen play, barring Dan Marino. I watched that fool. Yep. Now he started half season, then the second year he started full time. He threw almost fifty touchdowns back then, and that was unheard of. Yeah. That's because he was just that good. You know what? If he's read, he just reads the defense. You you see it every time. Defense moves around. He goes kill, kill, flat, flat, pancake, pancake, and they do something else, and it works. And he, under pressure, this is what I liked about him in the beginning of the season. You know, uh, preseason under pressure, he was controlled and was composed, and he kind of got a little loosey goosey. Sure. Uh, let me call it. Okie doke. <laughs> He got, uh, that wasn't even three minutes. He just had to go. He got a little loosey goosey, you sure. know, in the middle of the season. Honestly, I don't think it was him. I think it was just the rest of this young team figuring crap out. The guy looks like, I, 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 I am just in awe. Like, I'm going to wake up and find out, oh, he actually isn't even our quarterback. That was all a dream. Right. Now, I, I only saw CJ Stroud play once this year. That was yesterday. And he looked pretty good, too. And I didn't watch the whole game. I was smoking a whole bunch of ribs, mm. tricep. Oh my gosh! You don't even know. But um, West Coast. You know, I haven't seen him play as much. So I, I've seen Jordan play enough to where this guy he could be better than what we've ever had. And that's I don't I I mean, I mean I'll take it. I will definitely take it. And uh, so yeah, he he. It's it's like I'm in a dream, and he I I I still don't get how he's this good. Uh, and then everyone else, all those young receivers. I like the fact that I saw Watson still in the game in the fourth quarter. That means he must not be hurt. I know they didn't go to him. <clears throat> I don't know if they were using him as a coy, a decoy. I, I was screaming and having fun. I wasn't watching all the plays right. perfectly. I can't do that during a game. That's impossible. I agree. Plus, um, after that, they don't even show you what the receivers are doing. They just zoomed in on the uh, on the line of scrimmage. J. Aaron Jones, we have to keep him. He's even saying himself, he feels like he's got 23-year-old legs. We, I, I don't care what we have to do. We have to keep him. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying we don't need to draft a running back. We obviously need to, but we got to keep that guy. If he still feels fresh, I don't even care, I don't even care what it costs to keep him. Yeah. And defensively, I mean, they did good for a minute, and then I, I don't know if they were pulling out a bunch of defensive starters and putting in some no do, some nobodies. Obviously, you know, that's what happens during garbage time. The team that's down by 40 points to have to huff the ball up and, you know, um, what was it, 41 to 16, 14 to one point, something like that? That's <laughs> uh, Man, this was like the Lions game times 100. <clears throat> yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I have one Cowboys fan that admits it, and I – he told me it was going to be 38 to 10, you know, that we were going to get boat raped last mm-hmm. week when we found out we were going to play them. And all I do was text him after the game, hey, you were, you were close on the score. You just had the team wrong. <laughs> and I felt so bad. All he just, he texted me back, yeah, someone forgot to tell the Packers they weren't supposed to win. <laughs> and he just said he hates the Cowgirls. And I get it, man. They, they hate us so bad. That's amazing. Oh, well. <clears throat> Let's I, let's go back go. Let's do this next Saturday. <clears throat> let's go down to the whiners and stomp their teeth into the curb. <clears throat> yeah, I mean your description of Jordan Love sounds like what I was just talking about a minute ago. Where it's it's, you, I want to say what seems rational in my head, but then when you say the words, it seems irrational, and it's such a weird thing. You're like it's you know even when you said the sentence, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding you, but it was. You know, he could be better than than what we've had. It just makes you cringe because it it just feels like blasphemous. You're not allowed to say stuff like that, like, bro. Favre and Rogers, how dare you? And also, give me a break. I mean, better than that. There's been like two quarterbacks in history that you could even, you know, again, like what Marino and and Mahomes as even like debatably better than than uh, Rogers in terms of arm talent. You're just sounding stupid. But it's just, it's really just looking at it and saying, what if he doesn't stop doing what he's doing? 
Because if he doesn't stop doing what he's doing, then he's better. If it's like he does this once or twice ever, then he's similar. It's it's really just a consistency. It's not a talent thing. It's a consistency thing. What's going to happen next year? If we get, you know, like week nine through the end of the season, all year next year, that is going to end up being like a top Aaron Rodgers season. And it, it sounds stupid to say that, but it also sounds stupid to say that his the best season of Jordan Love's career ever is going to be in his first year. Really? Is that what we think? They're both stupid. I mean, if, again, if we just look at from week 12 on, and we just say, what if that's what he is next year? That would go down as about Rodgers' fourth best season ever. According to PFF grades, as a passer, it would be 2020, then 2011, and then 2014, he had a 91.7, actually it would be his fifth best, so 91.7, 91.6, and then Jordan Love is at 91.3. So you could say it's his fifth best season or just like a three-way tie between Rodgers in 2014 and 2010. The two years that stand out as better would be 2011 and 2020. And again, this is his first year. Another way to say that is that Rodgers has had 11 seasons that are worse than what Jordan Love has done in the second half of the season, including some of his best. So again, everything about this is stupid and nothing makes sense. <laughs> I, can't, I can't summarize what we're seeing without sounding stupid one way or another. What's up, y'all? This is Dakota, not married in Tennessee. What's up? Um, I'm currently listening to the newest Tiger Night After Dark mm-hmm. that was released on... Oh, uh, no. Today. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> hold on one second. Two and four, two clear. I'll meet you at the visitor center. Uh, I'm going to hang out. <laughs> He's got to go solve some crimes. I'm going to skip Kyle for a second, get back to Dakota, since we... Kind of got interrupted there. Hey, this is Dakota, that nerd in Tennessee again, and um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to finish the call this time. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, that was a great win against Dallas. That was absolutely awesome. But I, I came to two realizations. Um, well, I mean, one of them amusing, and the other one just, you know, great information, or great news. So, um you know, Bo Milton didn't really make much of a, uh, an impact until, you know, very recently. Uh, and then he just started to kill it, strangely. Mm-hmm. And so we essentially have of the deepest receiver core that I've ever watched. I, I never actually got to watch when um, Rodgers first started. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I never got to see that, you know, whole crew actually in action. In real time, but anyway, um, this is a this is the deepest receiver I've ever seen for Green Bay. It's awesome. Uh, I'm very excited about everything. But I mean, Bo Melton, he's making great contributions, and he's brand new, fresh face. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, Aaron Jones. He, I mean, he he's relatively fresh. He hasn't been used for most of the uh, you know season. He's been hurt for for a lot of it, so. He's, he's relatively fresh, so we got a new Aaron Jones, fresh Aaron Jones. And A.J. Dillon literally just posted uh, something last night uh, of uh, Goku in whatever the tank is where he's attached to all the hoses and he's sitting there resting he's about to come out and mess somebody's life up. Yeah, so A.J. Oh, Dillon yeah. feels like he's pretty rested and he's ready to go. So we, we do have a bunch of new recruits and rested recruits. And that's just very exciting. Another realization I came across, or I, I thought of, um, which actually has hit me a while back, but because of how well we're doing and how Jordan loves killing it, and it's looking like we got three in a row, I hope everybody knows that we are, you know, Darth Vader. We are the Empire. <laughs> Every, everybody hates us. Um, very few. We are literally what the Patriots, well, I mean, not literally, but we are what the Patriots were to everybody. Everybody hated the Patriots, because they kept winning, they kept doing well, and, and people were just tired of seeing them. So, for all those of y'all out there that's wondering why everybody's hating on us, that's why. We are the Empire from Star Wars. We are Darth Vader. We are the bad guy that keeps coming in, and, and uh, yeah, and I'm okay with that. And uh, I'm, I'm good with the good, uh, you know, 
couple years of the Empire reigning supreme. Anyway, y'all, peace out. Like Jason, man, we just won't die. Dude gets killed every time and just keeps coming back. And every time they make movies, it's like, well, that time he's definitely dead. I did see the most recent one. I don't remember how it ended, but I know it ended with... Actually, I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know. He's probably not dead, though. Somehow, some way, he's coming back. And you're right. That's exactly how, like, Bears fans feel about us. Like, I don't know, but I know he's not dead. I know they're not going to lose. At this point, that's what they're going to be saying. If Jordan Love just decided to retire tomorrow, um, we'd, we'd end up starting Sean Clifford, and Bears fans would be like, I know he's going to be good. Like, I just... I don't even want to. I don't even want to talk about it because I know he's going to be good. Ryan Kyle from Madison, what is up, dude? What's up, man? It, it, the best day ever is turning into the best week ever. <laughs> it's Victory Monday. It's so flipping glorious. And not to mention, we even have you know more playoff football like starting. You know, it's uh, Martin Luther King Day. A lot of people off work. We get an afternoon game because of the snow, and then we get an evening game. Like, dude, just. It, oh, it's just freaking glorious, man. And let me just say, we talked this summer. I remember calling in and saying, what a great opportunity, like, from a coaching standpoint, LeFleur had here because the, the us against the world trope is so tried and true for coaches, you know, to push these buttons. Sure. And this team was so set up, you know, for LeFleur to run that, that big-time us against the world routine. And then with the way the season went, and with how our quarterback and some of our young players popped skill-wise, when it all kind of came together, man, it just perfectly, you know, just fit that um, that whole scheme. And then nobody says we can do it against Minnesota, you know? And maybe they can't close it out against Chicago. And then this week it was, yeah, that's a good story and great and no expectations, house money, et cetera. But they can't do it against the Cowboys, right? So then they boat race the Cowboys. And guess what? This week's going to be. Well, that was nice, but it's Dallas. Dallas lost it. There's no way they can win against San Francisco. It sets up perfectly. Like, go ahead, read your clippings, boys. You're not going to be able to get too high on that because I guarantee you the morons of the world out there are just going to say, well, that was cute, but now you, got, you still got no chance. Right. So from a coaching standpoint and a motivational standpoint, I mean, you can't ask for a better setup. Yeah. Like, there's no world in which the Packers could be favored. Maybe if they make it a championship game, there's some weird world where they'd be favored, but most likely they'd be underdog the whole rest of the way. So it just it sets up great, man. Like, even the coach can go in that locker room and be like, nobody believes in you except the guys in this room and some of our fans, and then they can look outside at the national media landscape, and that's exactly what people are going to be saying. You're not going to win. Right. You got lucky. You played against a crappy team, whatever it is. So... You know, if they can bring the same level of preparation, they can bring the same level of focus, and hopefully some of these guys, like J- Jair, who got injured, I'm really looking for an update on that. But this organic bar is probably out, which is sneaky, not a sneaky painful injury for us, but everybody's hurt this time of year. The 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 motivational thing lines up freaking perfectly for LaFleur to really dial this, this team in for, for the rest of this run, you know, because it's going to be us against the world, right? Every freaking week. Love it. So happy, man. What a great day. Take care, y'all. Yeah, and that was kind of what I mentioned kind of earlier on is just this feeling of, you know, we're just happy to be here. But if we beat Dallas, dude, it's legit, and nobody can deny it anymore. And that was true to an extent, but not true enough that people give us a shot against San Francisco. And then even if we beat San Francisco, it's like, okay, but if we beat this team, it's definitely legit. But once you get into the Super Bowl, it's going to be the same thing. Now, it might be less so, but make no mistake about it. We're not going to be favorites against whatever. It could be Buffalo. It could be Baltimore. It could, it could be uh, the Chiefs. It might even be the Texans. Because as much as you might think the Packers could be favored over the Texans, I mean, yeah, we had to face some tough teams, but they were going to have to be Buff- uh, Baltimore. And then after Baltimore, they're going to have to play either Buffalo or Kansas City. And if they beat those two teams, they're going to be seen as just as much of a powerhouse. So aside from, you know, Tampa and or Detroit, where I think the Packers would probably be favored either way, coming off a victory against Dallas and the 49ers, even if it's in Detroit, I think Green Bay ends up the favorite. But you're right, aside from that, I think the Packers are underdogs all the way through, regardless of who they're playing. 
But anyways, why don't we uh, button this thing up? You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.